the player that I'm really mindful and wary of is a player who is what I would say too invested at such a young age on the AFL, um, and they they do at times get themselves um, too narrow focused on the AFL pathway and sort of disregard Plan B, if you know what I mean. And that's a danger. That's there's a huge risk involved in that with young players. So we we do spend. And we're lucky enough that we have a, a, a an athlete wellbeing officer here, and who still plays football for the Glenelg, and he's been through the AFL system. His name's Jack Henneth. So he and I will do a lot of work on player education around wellbeing and mindfulness, and and having a clear indication of what their life and what their identity looks like, regardless of whether they can play football or not. Um, so let's just take football right out of the equation. Who are you and what do you stand for and what do you want to be recognised as? That was this week's guest, Tony Bamford. Welcome to the One on One Football Podcast. My name is Harry Simmington, co-host of the show. Now, um, we've just finished recording our discussion with Tony. Um, Tony is uh, one of our most popular coaches here on the, the platform, One on One Football. Um, but he's also the South Australian um, talent coordinator. So he, he coaches the under 18s and he, and he works with, through that whole pathway. Um, He's worked with a lot of um, very talented players that have gone on to um, to play, play in the AFL. Um, notably, Jason Horn recently, um, Lukosius and uh, and Isaac Rankin from the Suns, um, and we discuss um, uh, Caleb Daniel as well. So he's um, he's he's had uh, a lot of experience in the talent pathway and and seen a lot of players go through that system. Now, today's episode is an absolute ripper uh, for anyone who wants to get drafted um, or if you work with um, uh, aspiring draftees as a coach or if you're a parent who um, who's supporting a, an aspiring draftee as well, this is an, um, a, a must-listen episode. Um, Tony's got a great perspective. He's a very humble man. Um, he's, he's actually won three premierships at, um, at the Port Adelaide Football Club um, in the Sandfall, but uh, he, hardly, uh, he hardly talks about it, so we had to really dig that one out of him. Um, but he's, he's got a fantastic mentality on, on development. Um, again, similar to Dale Tapping, um, understands that uh, as, a, as a talent coach, not only are you preparing them for an AFL career, but also um, you're preparing these, these young players for, for life as well. And, um, and, and the emphasis that he puts on those traits is, uh, is fantastic. Um, one particular um, part of the chat that I really enjoyed was um, when he was talking about uh, what's, what's the most effective way to, to get the most out of your team, especially in a system where you've only got maybe 10 weeks to deal with the state team um, and you've got to teach some structures and whatnot. And, and, and he sort of brought it back and said, okay, teaching structures are not going to be as effective as teaching really good clean ball skills to each and every player. And if you add those clean ball skills up from every player, then you get um, a really uh, a really well oiled machine. Now, the reason why I like that so much is that you can prepare for per- like the best case scenario, and that's your team structure and that's your ball movement. But then the reality of football is that it's really chaotic. So um, his perspective, and I, th- I think he said, prepare for chaos. So he prepares all of his players to be able to deal with the chaos of the football field, as opposed to. Um, preparing them for certain different scenarios and um, uh, pretending that we can predict them because we obviously can't. Um, so I love that that theme of prepare for chaos. Um, so without further ado, guys, I'll, I'll jump off the mic. Uh, this is episode number 20 with Tony Bamford. You're listening to the One on One Football Podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie Rules training, coaching and development tips. Welcome, Tony. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show, mate. My pleasure. Thanks for having us, guys. Now, mate, just quickly before we launch into the, the real questions, where did the nickname Bangers come from? Oh, this is a long story. I'm going to We're try ready and for short, it. We're ready I'm for going it. To shorten it for you. I'll give it the, um, when I was 15, I was playing for a club called Kedron in Brisbane. Yep. And our arch rival was Wilston Grange. Yep. Grange, you yep. might be familiar yeah, with those two clubs. Yep. yep. The next year level under 17s, we couldn't field a team at Kedron. We didn't have enough players. So we went and played football with Wilston Grange for that year, which was a big big call because we hated them before we played with them. Yep. And the new coach there in under 17s, um, he was the father of another player that I, I knew growing up playing a lot of football against him, Josh. Um, his father was a coach and because we had some new players in the team, he it took a while for him to get to, to know all of our names. And uh, one, I can't remember whether it was a training session or a game, he's going around the players one by one and he gets to me and he's I could, he's doing trying to remember what my name was. 
and he just he was on top. He's going, don't tell me, don't tell me. And then he goes, oh, bugger it. You're bangers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how it starts from then. Back in, I would have been 15, no, 16. And yeah, 47 it's now. And it's, I've still got it, unfortunately. No, that's a sign of a, that's a sign of a good nickname when it uh, when it sticks. Yeah, yeah it stuck early, and uh, when I came down here to Port Adelaide to play footy, first thing you know they ask you is what you got a nickname. Yeah, and um, and I sort of pretended that I didn't have a nickname, but Fabian Francis, who I knew from Brisbane back yeah, in the day, busy. he was at Port, and he knew me. And he quickly told everyone that my nickname was Bangers. So I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bit of a stitch yeah, up there. Foot, small world, footy clubs. Foot, small yeah. world. Yeah. Now, now, mate, we've got um, we've got plenty of listeners all around the country. We've got a couple in, international as well. But for maybe the interstate um, listeners, uh, who is Tony Bamford and um, what's your role in footy? Okay, so I'm employed by the SNFL as the um, state under 18 male academy coach um, and program manager. So. I've been in this job for five years, and I love it. It's um, almost a perfect job, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I basically oversee the, the talent pathway for, for boys from, from South Australia from the age of 15 through to, you know, 18 or 19, if they're old enough, if, they're, if they play nationals as an overage player, and essentially try and give them the skill sets and, and the life skills to um, to – to maybe get drafted into the AFL. But if that doesn't happen, um, we put a massive emphasis here in the Sandville of preparing guys to play league football in our competition yep. as well. Uh, we, we're strong about how viable and how strong our Sandville men's and women's competitions are here in, in South Australia. And it's a, great, it's a great achievement for our players if they don't go into AFL than to go back to their Sandville clubs and you know, become you know, 10-year players, 100, 200-game players, future captains, etc. Um, I, I think that's why, one of the reasons why I love this job so much. Yeah, spot on. I think we've covered on the show before too, um, you know, kids out there playing to get drafted or playing for the love of the game. And obviously there's that disappointment when they, when they don't get drafted. But, you know, where do they sort of go after that? And I know myself working in, a, in, the, in the same industry in the same sort of department as you, it's, it's that keeping, you know, keeping that sort of homegrown talent in your state and trying to make state football better. And obviously... A, a great competition over there, mate. Um, I've watched a bit of their NFL and and seen some you know terrific players come through. And arguably, it's probably the you know the best competition um, you know outside of the AFL. So um, obviously, you came through that um, competition, mate. So let's rewind the clock a, a little bit in your playing career and um, your premiership player, triple premiership player with with Port Adelaide and the NFL. And a, what type of player with you? And and B, um, well, sorry, what type of player were you? And B, um, how close did you sort of come to that AFL dream? Um, I always had the had a dream to play AFL, despite the fact that I grew up in Brisbane. But I played um, Aussie Rules football in Brisbane from the age of you know six years of age. So um, I was lucky enough to get a chance to come down and, and play footy in the Sandville for Port Adelaide Magpies before the Port Port Power joined the AFL. Um, and initially, I thought I came down for like a um, a four week trial in the middle of the year left Kedron, Kedron Grange, the footy club that we played for at the time, and Wayne Johnston was my coach um, at Kedron. The dominator. And, uh, the dominator, yeah. And um, and he... Uh, we played in the grand final, actually. Um, if I go back a couple of years, we played in the grand final against Morningside, and it was... Um, it's still one of the worst memories of my life because we lost by um, one point in that grand final, and... And Morningside had been such a really strong, successful club for a, for a long, long time. Uh, Marty King, their, their, their coach at the time. And, you know, we used to be really jealous of the strength and the, and the success that Morningside had, along with Southport. And we were just, we came from nowhere the years before to get into the grand final. And, and that really hurt, still hurts me now when I think about it. Um, but yeah, then um, I got a chance to, to come to Port Adelaide. Mike Johnston put in a good word for, for me down here at, at Sample, and so did Mark, Martin Leslie, who was just finishing his time at yeah, Brisbane. No one draft pick, I think Martin was at the Bears. Yeah, Martin, yeah. yeah, and from Port Adelaide. And he obviously had some connections with Port Adelaide at the time. And I just finished a pre-season with, um, with, the, with Brisbane, um, trying to get on their supplementary list back as a 19-year-old or 20-year-old. Um, and that, I, got, I got a chance to play a couple of like, pre-season games for the Lions and 
but Sorry, nothing so what, what, what year was that? So this would have been 95 and, yep. yeah, 95 and again 96, I think. Yeah, was so Aka, Aka running around? So yeah, that's yeah, similar. So yeah, yeah, we had we had Aka, um, you know, last episode. Yeah. So there you oh, go. Did you? A bit of, um, Am I yeah, following Aka? <laughs> sorry? Yeah, <laughs> mate. So <laughs> there you go, mate, in elite company. Well, you know, two great Queenslanders, mate, and, and myself and Harry, he's a Queenslander, so I've got a bit of a... Uh, <laughs> bit of a theme going. Know, a few mate, origins I on him. could have put a bit of colour through my <laughs> <laughs> No, Aka, Aka was a bit young, a couple of years younger than me, but yeah. um, we play a lot of footy against each other as juniors, and yeah, yeah he was a ripper. Um, but yeah, no, Aka was floating around. He was really young at that stage. Um, and anyway, so yeah, Port Adelaide rang up and said, you know, we're, we'd like uh, you to come down and do a month of trial with us before the June 30 deadline, and, and I jumped at the opportunity to, to head down. Mm. And I knew I knew a fair bit about Port Adelaide. I only threw that magazine Inside Footy. Remember that? Inside yeah, footy yeah, magazine? yeah, Inside Footy. Yeah. Oh, man, that was Great, a highlight mate. of my, highlight of I my week. I used to buy it on the uh, plane on the interstate trips, you know, sort of yeah. just get the fucking like uh, yeah. footy newspaper. It was un- yeah. unbelievable. So I used to read the back of that, and there's always a page in the sample, and, and for years on years, how good Port Adelaide Magpies were. So mm. when they rang and said, do you want to come down and try, I, I jumped at the opportunity. and So I came down, did four weeks in the reserves, and, and played under uh, Greg Phillips, who was a, is a um, Aaron's, Aaron Phillips. That's Aaron's dad. dad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Kuch, his nickname's Kuchi, and he was wonderful as a coach. And um, I loved it. I loved the club. I loved the environment. Um the player, the leaders that have been around the club for a while and had a fair bit of success. I think they were, they'd won four of the five premierships the year before I got there or something like that. So I was very, really, very, very lucky to land in a great club. Um, when my four weeks came up, I, I had a conversation with the club. I was due to fly back to Brisbane and they said, look, we really want you to come back and play the year out and, and, and you know, try and get onto an AFL list from here. So I literally jumped on the plane, went back to Brisbane and within three days, I was back down in Adelaide and living there for what was supposed to be another year and a half, um, wow. which has now turned into 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a South Australian now. Um, I go back to Brisbane sort of maybe once a year to see my family yeah. and, and whatnot, but I always look forward to getting back here in Adelaide. Yeah, for sure, and and, and that's um that's, that's great to hear you say that you're you're South Australian because you've got a rich history in um in SA football now, and you've uh, very modestly breezed over the the triple premierships. Um, but pump him up, Harry. Pump him yeah, up. Yeah, someone's got to. Um, well, like I said, like I said, Harry and Rainsy, I was very lucky. I, I fell into a great club at a good time, um, and yeah, I, I got carried through the first premiership. I have to admit, I played in '96. We, we played Centrals, and I think I spent more time on the bench than I did on the field. Um, that was in 96, so I'd only played, I think the grand final was my seventh game, to be honest with you. So oh, I'd yeah. gone from playing in front of, you know, 100 people mm. in, at a, in a quaffle, at a quaffle game, to playing in front of 45,000 people. Yeah, it's pretty big out there, isn't it? Sanford grand final, it just blew my mind. And it's Marlon and Pickle My dad came down for it, my sister came down for it, and some aunties and uncles who live in regional New South Wales drove over for it. So yeah, great day, great experience. That was '96, and then the next year I did an, I did my knee. So I, uh, I was lucky enough to play in the state game for South Australia and did my knee in the first five minutes and missed the whole year of footy. Um, and yeah, came back and played in the premierships in '98 and '99. '98 was against Sturt, um, and '99 was against Nord. Both really close games. I mean, uh, from memory. Um, the, the score changed maybe three or four times in the last quarter of both those games, but we were lucky enough to win both those grand finals so yeah as i said lucky i landed at port adelaide at the right time yeah that's a that's actually a really good segue to the the next question which was what was the what was the culture like at at the port magpies at that time and um obviously you came through as a port player and then transitioned into a into a port coach so do you think having a a, an understanding of the culture helped with that transition oh no doubt it did And, and port port had a bit of a well back then had a bit of a um tendency to employ former players as coaches yep. whether that was right or wrong so I guess I was quite lucky in that regard that they wanted me to be their lead coach after coaching the under 18s for three years um, but yeah the culture well I'll give you an example so I walk into the change rooms at under Albert and Oval um, on a on a Tuesday night before a main training session I didn't know anyone apart from Bob Clayton who was a football manager uh, I knew Fabian Francis, obviously, as I said before. And um, 
I'm sitting in, I'm standing in the corner of this training, of the training um, rooms and waiting to be shown where to go to get all my gear and whatnot. And Bob was engaged in the conversation with someone else. So I was just standing alongside Bob, obviously looking pretty nervous and anxious. And I saw this guy uh, from across the room make eye contact with me and he was in his playing gear. I knew he was a player, but I didn't know at the time. It ended up being the captain, Tim Ginova. And so Tim comes over and, and rescue, rescues me pretty much and says, G'day, I'm Tim. You must be the Queenslander. Um, so he, from that point forward, he, he took me under his wing and took me over and showed me where to get shorts and training top and socks and where to put my bag and where to get changed and introduced me to some players and, and the staff. And to be honest, at, at that That's moment unreal. there, I, I knew that I was in the right club. Mm. I just felt, I felt, um, important, even though I wasn't, <laughs> yeah. and and I thought, wow, this is amazing. And and the other thing that caught my eye that night was just the standard of training. Like it was a massive jump up for me to go from Quaffle uh, training to Sample League training with the best team in the competition, and yeah. and I love that. I love that whole um, the harder you work, the more rewards type culture that Port Adelaide had back then, and we trained really, really hard. Um, so yeah, it was yeah. The, the culture was very, very clear to be seen. I didn't have to be sat down and told what it was like because I could see it yeah. with my own eyes, and I loved it. That's usually the best um, sign of culture too. You walk into some organisations, they got a million words written up on the wall, and yeah. you just wonder sometimes whether they um, obviously you've got to have them, yeah. um, but you just wonder sometimes if they're actually living it, and those actions sort of speak louder than. Yeah. Than, uh, than anything, don't they? I suppose so. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's so, that's so true. We we have we talk about that in our state program, even though we have we only have our guys for ten weeks, really. Mm. Um, and, and initially, in the first few weeks of your state program, you'll you'll do some activity to you know where the players will come up with some values that they want to be lived by. But I don't get them printed up. We just talk about them and then come up with some real life examples mm-hmm. about you know what what does that look like in our environment. And you know who's responsible for it, and and then you just really sit back and hope that the leaders take control. Really, mm-hmm. um, some years it's a big success, and some years it's probably a bit yeah. hit and miss. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, it's good. Some good um, themes there, and also too, it's just <laughs> some of our younger footballers aspiring to they don't quite get there, get drafted, or they actually are still going to tr- try and live that dream. And a lot of people, uh, kids, have gone down from Queensland to. Or New yeah. South Wales, uh, developing states, NT, gone to South Australia, and and uh, who knows, they might end up there for the next twenty odd years. And <laughs> I think that's the best thing about footy. Um, and as oh, you I said, you go to a great club, and the yeah. standards are there. And um, I think that's um, yeah, a really good message for for some of our listeners. Um, and to, and on to your sort of coaching, mate. Um, you've coached players of all ages, you know, throughout your career. Um, yeah. You know, but really seem to have found your niche in this sort of talent space, which is sort of what I fell in love with too when I first started coaching. Um, what's the most rewarding rewarding part of you know working um, in the in the youth talent programs? Oh, look, um, it's probably the great thing about what we do, Rainsy, and and other talent pathway coaches across Australia is we're, we're lucky. We get to work with with the, the mm-hmm. best players in the competition. So, um, you know, I just love the mindset that elite players have, and I and I, I love working with highly motivated young men not just footballers but you know young men as well and that that is in turn motivates me to be a better coach and to be better at my job um so that's what i love the most i mean i, I did enjoy my time coaching uh, league footy at the magpies and I, I learned so much about myself as a coach during that period um but yeah i, I get far greater reward from from just watching the development of these boys across you know for some of them three years if they're in their program as a top age 16, then a, a bottom mm. age 17 in the 18s, and then again top age, you, you get to see them grow, not as just footballs, but young men. And, and you, in the end, you form really strong relationships with those guys. And, um, you know, it, it's that, those relationships that last further on past their draft year, whether they go into the AFL or whether they go back and play sample football, are really, really important to me. I, I just had a phone call actually this morning from a guy who uh, missed the draft last year and uh, just rang up out of the blue, asking a few questions about. He's got a couple of options about what he wants, what he can do now, football-wise and and also career-wise. And 
it was I was really um, flattered that he rang me and, and asked for some advice and some guidance while I'm making those decisions. So, yeah, that's the best part about uh, working with that age group and, and highly motivated people. Couldn't agree more, Harry. It's a, it's a bit like our relationship. So Harry came through the, the Suns Academy and, and obviously then played some allies football in the under-18, so people would have coached against him. And now he's uh, now he's working in my organisation, which is, um, you know, sort of those relationships are just incredible. Yeah. It's more than football, isn't it? I think that's the best thing about sort of that coaching that, those age groups. Yeah, that's right. You sit, I mean, we have to understand that they're not just footballers. They've got a lot going on in their life mm. uh, during those, those years. Um, what physically and emotionally they're developing and changing very, very quickly. So to see that and, and play a small part in, I guess, you know, the end product is really re- rewarding, whether that's if they do go and play AFL or if they uh, maybe play sample for a number of years and become captains of their clubs and premiership players or McGarry medalists. And, yeah, it's all, it's all very, very enjoyable to sit back and watch. They've got two pathway coaches. Uh, two pathway questions. Um, we have a lot of coaches listen to this, and, and obviously the football. So give us a bit of a breakdown on, well, I suppose your own personal sort of journey. We just touched on then how you coached the under 18s yep, at, okay. at Port, and then went on to senior coach, and then sort of how you progressed from there, or, or what, how you got into sort of the job you are now. And then I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll ask you a bit more about the uh, the players and how they get into the pathways in, in South Australia. Okay. Well. Um... So like I said, I was playing football at Port Magpies and had a lot of success early in, I spent the 10 or 11 years there at Magpies and a lot of my on-field success came in the first five years. Um, in the last sort of three to four years of my playing career, I, I, I missed more football than I played through injury and had some, um, some ha- ongoing hamstring issues and lower back problems and I... I tore a peck doing a gym session one day, just silly stuff that were really frustrating. So, yeah, that those last three years of football for me were uh, was probably where the coaching bug started, to be honest with you, because I never really envisaged that I'd be a coach while I was a young football player. Yeah. It wasn't until I became, you know, 27, 28, 29, where I started to think about, you know, is this something that I, that I could or would want to do? And it all came off the back of um, my coach at the time, Steve Williams, um, it, is it, is it Choco's brother? Choco's brother, yeah. Yeah, Choco's brother. Yeah, yeah. Choco's brother. He coached me in all three of my premierships at, at, at the Magpies. He took over from John Cale when John went to the yeah. AFL. Um, he invited me into the coach's box one day when I was injured because I think he could sense my frustration. I hated it. I was a bad, <laughs> I was a bad injured player. You know what they're like, Ramsey yeah. and Harry? You know, those <laughs> players who just get grumpy and mope around. That was me. I, I, could, I hated it. Um, Anyway, he invited me into the coach's box one day, the home game, and gave me a little thing to do, watching some midfield stuff. And and that was the first time where I really actually thought, you know, this is, a, this is a different. I'd never seen the game from this perspective. Um, and, and I guess from that point forward, I started to do some, you know, I guess my own self-preparation and some investigation on what coaching might look like and some courses that I could do and, I was lucky enough that I was working at the SNFL at the time as a junior development officer, going out to schools and doing clinics and whatnot. Um, so I was always involved in footy, and that's where the yeah, that's where the coaching passion sort of started. When I finished playing football, um, I was thirty-one, and the club um, offered me the job as the talent manager in their zone. So down here in the sample level, every club's got a country metro zone. <clears throat> um, and the talent manager or development manager they were called back then, their responsibility was to, yeah, look after the zone, the junior clubs, the schools, and also develop a pathway from in their zone for talented players to get through into their junior programs and ultimately play league football. And um, so I took on that job and, and learned a lot about um, building relationships with key people and, and um I mean, the coaching thing sort of come a bit naturally. It was more my growth had to come in the communication, um, I guess, styles, whether I was talking to a junior president or a parent of a 13-year-old or Mm -hmm. a a 13-year-old themselves or whether I was trying to get a new sponsor for the junior program. So I learned a lot about the industry in those few years. While I was doing that, I was also, um, in my first year, I was an assistant coach to the under-17s. The under-17 coach... Back then was a, was a wonderful man called Malcolm Maiden, 
who had been around juniors at Port Adelaide for a number of years. And he would have been late 60s, great coach, kept football really, really simple. And I learned a lot being his assistant coach in that first year. After that, Malcolm went up to coach the 19s and I took over um, what was then turned into the under-18 under competition and coached him for three years uh, at Port Adelaide. Um, we played in two grand finals, but unfortunately we got, we got nutted in both of those. Um, Sturt got us once and then Gonell got us as well. Uh, and then, um, yeah, then I got tapped on the shoulder by the, the board and the football director at the Magpies saying, you know, we're, we're in the hunt for a new league coach. I would like you to uh, go through the process and interview for it. And I really, had, it caught me by surprise. I wasn't, didn't think that I would be considered for that role, having only coached for, you know, three and a half years prior. Um, but I went through the process thinking, well, it'd be a good experience to do anyway. And, and I did it, uh, put a presentation forward and they offered me the job. Um, so, yeah, I was coaching league football and I was, I was, the hardest thing for me to get my head around was I was going to be coaching players that I played with, mm-hmm. and um, which is not always easy. And uh, so, yeah, we coached them for three years. And as I said before, I learned a lot about um, the art of coaching and, and managing relationships and the highs and lows, particularly at, at such a you know um, high-pressured environment, league football at Port Magpies. Um, a club with so much success and history and tradition. Um, after that, I finished my time at the Magpies and then um, the club wanted me to stay and go back and, and be their talent manager again and work the zone and coach the under-18s. Um, at that stage, I'll, I didn't think I was going to develop myself much going back to that job that I'd done before. Um, and in the meantime, I'd had an approach from uh, South Adelaide Football Club here in the SNFL to uh, to go down and, and and do a bit of work on their zone, which had, for whatever whatever reason their zone had never really delivered on its full potential in terms of player retention and recruiting, and then ultimately performance. And I saw that as a really exciting challenge for me professionally um, to get out of Port Adelaide because I needed to. I'd always been a Port Adelaide person, um, and I remember sitting down and talking to a, a mentor of mine at the time and. And he said, well, what do you want to do, bangers? Do you want to remain comfortable and keep doing what you know you can already do? Or do you want to, you know, test yourself out and, and go and see if you can have an impact somewhere else? Mm. And ultimately, oh. I decided to go down to South Adelaide. And um, I loved my time down there at South Adelaide. Like all footy clubs, and you guys will be familiar with this, there's always great people at clubs and volunteers and people who are devoted to the club for whatever reason. You, you'll find a number of them at every single footy club at all levels across Australia. And South Adelaide was no different. And I fell in love with the place very early because of the people that I met and, and built relationships with down there and coached them for five years. Were, was able to rejig the zone a little bit in the way that um, South Adelaide set up their junior pathways and got the, the clubs um, more engaged in what we were offering at Sample level. And, um, yeah, the... Uh, I think I think the zone now runs quite well and, and have had some really good success in, in their junior programs in the last couple of years with their under-18s have played in a couple of grand finals. Their under-16s won a grand final last year. So, yeah, they're starting to get some um, quality players out of their zone, um, which, you know, I'm quite proud of that that's, that's achieved, that, that ultimate goal of the zone player getting through their pathway is now evident. Mm. And then um, this position came up here at, at the sample, so the AFL decided they wanted a full-time coach here in the SNFL to manage the talent pathway into the AFL. And um, Brenton Phillips at the time, who was the coach, and he's now the head of talent for male and female over here, um, he couldn't do the, the head job, the, the head coaching job, as well as be the the, the talent pathway manager. So. Uh, they advertised a the job and I applied for it. And, yeah, I was lucky enough to, to be offered that position back in uh, the middle of 2017 and been here ever since. Yeah, awesome. It's amazing. Quite a, quite a journey and obviously having a, a, a real big um, impact with um, with plenty of young footballers out there. I just want to um, touch on something you, you spoke about before when you said that um, your coaching sort of started when you, were, um, when you got injured and you got really frustrated at the injury. I think 
that sort of mindset when you do get injured is really common. I know I've experienced as well, and there's probably a lot of listeners out there that have either been through something similar or or are going to in the future. Um, do you think that that's a, a, an issue that they sort of attach their identity to playing football? So like, um, you know, I, I, I'm Tony, I'm a footballer. And then all of a sudden, when you're playing great footy, life's as good as anything. When you're not, it's the opposite. Um, first off, do you think that's got something to do with it? And then how do you manage that with your players today? Or how do you, how do you support them through something like an injury and, um, and sort of working out how to, how to stay in a, in a positive mindset? Yeah. yeah, well, for me personally, it was just because I, I was a competitor and I wasn't able mm-hmm. to compete on the weekends. And I know it's, 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 not, it's not factual, but I felt like I was letting my team down because I wasn't playing and, and, and I was far too hard on myself in that period of time. So, I mean, that was my particular situation back then. Um, I'm, I'm sure other players would have different uh, stories around how they felt and how being injured out a long time maybe would have impacted them. But I, I think one thing that contributed to my frustration was I worked full-time in footy as well. Yep. So it was all football for me, Monday to Friday, and then Saturday, being injured, it just wasn't a good mix. So may, maybe I would have had a different mindset had I you know, been working in a different industry other than football. And I might, I might have been able to have that outlet that didn't frustrate me as much as being in football seven days a week did yep. back then. The, the, the point you make about how players deal with long-term injury um, is, is really relevant. And I, it, it does change with the mindset of the individual. I found mm-hmm. in my time, every, every player has a different story and a different background and a, you know, different motivating factors. Um, the player that I'm really mindful and wary of is a player who is what I would say too invested at such a young age on the AFL. Mm. Um, and they, they do at times get themselves um, too narrow focused on the AFL pathway and sort of disregard plan B, if you know what I mean. And that's a danger. That's, there's a huge risk involved mm. in that with young players. So we, we do spend, and we're lucky enough that we have a, uh, an athlete well-being officer here and he still plays football for the Glenelg and he's been through the AFL system. His name's Jack Henner. So he and I will do a lot of work on player education around well-being and mindfulness and, and having a clear indication of what their life and what their identity looks like regardless of whether they can play football or not. Um, so let's just take football right out of the equation. Yeah. Who are you and what do you stand for and what do you want to be recognised as? I think if players can identify that and come up with almost like a mental image of who they want to be when they're 20 that has nothing to do with football, yeah. I think that's a really good starting point um, to manage that transition either into the AFL or maybe through the draft and then they miss a chance and then they've, they sort of know where they're going to head and they've sort of started to plan that journey already. Yeah. Um, you can only hope that that happens. Oh, I, I know for a fact that some players just think they're going to get drafted uh, and for whatever reason. They might read an article on a, on a website that says they're, they're certain to be drafted in the late in the draft. And when you read that as a coach, you just go, oh, my God, here we go. It's, Do you reckon is, the parents play a fair part in that too, mate? Parents can, can ev- elevate performance a lot more as than know. what coaches will. And, again, one of the things we try and do here in SA is we, we spend a bit of time educating the parents as much as mm. the players on – how best to, you know, um, I guess, keep their son's feet firmly on the ground. Mm. It's an ongoing battle. It's an ongoing battle. We have player managers who are telling these players that they're probably, in some situations, not all the time, but sometimes they tell them they're better than what they are. Um, and, yeah, we have, to, <laughs> we have to remind these players and these families that sometimes the player manager will tell you what you want to hear because they want your business. Mm. Um, yep. But the only people you need to listen to are your, your coach at your Sandville club or your college or myself. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's an ongoing battle. Parent, I, I think parents all in all uh, are okay, but sometimes they get carried away with the hype around it as well, yeah. um, which is understandable because, again, if you, you've only got to look at the internet leading into the nationals and how much media attention these yeah. guys are getting. and Some of them haven't really done a lot to justify the media attention in my opinion it's yeah. just because someone saw them play well when they were 16 that now they're all of a sudden they're going to be the 
a top 10 draft choice. It just doesn't happen that way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, a lot of time and energy put on put into, um, you know, managing player expectation and keeping their goals realistic and, and more importantly, uh, making sure that they're focused on plan B if plan A doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, we've spoken about plan B on this podcast before. I think if you are a footballer out there and maybe you are an absolute shoe in and you're going to go number one like, and you're going to have a long AFL career, you've still got to do that, like, exercise that you spoke about you know what do i want my identity to be in the future because football is a it's a young person's game you've still got another you know 40 50 years of your life more after that so i think that's really um that's really important and there's um, hopefully a lot of listeners out there that, that can take a lot away from that that's um that's gold oh look we, we've got we've we could go back in the years and, and pull out players on every year who um for whatever reason decided to not go to university or have a gap year and and um, just focus on footy, and they they don't get drafted. Mm. And, and it, the reason is because they they don't have good balance in their life. Mm. It becomes too centred on one thing, and there's no outlet for them. So Jason Horn is such a great example of um, getting good balance in your life. So J, everyone knows who Jason Horn is, and uh, he he was going to school. Um, I remember talking to him at the end of year ten. Um, at the, he, he was obviously a, an exceptional player at under-16 level in the Nationals and, and he was just hanging in there at school. He just he goes, oh, bangers, I know I've got to go, but I'm really, I'd rather be out working. I'm just getting pretty bored at school. And I remember the conversation along the lines of, well, Jace, I'd like you to give it, I'd like you to commit to year 11 at least and then let's talk about this again after year 11. Um and which he did, and his parents were on board as well. And I think deep down, his mum, Trish, uh, and dad, and Fabian probably knew that eventually it was going to crack, and he, he, it would it'd be time for Jace to go and get mm. a job. But um, when he when that point came, which was sort of I think in memory three quarters of the way through his year eleven year at school, uh, he had that conversation with with um, with us and mum and dad, and said, oh, "I just can't do this anymore." It's a waste of my time. Um, and uh, his parents both said, right, yeah, Jace, you've got a month to find yourself a job. If you can find yourself a job, then, yep, we'll support your decision to leave school. But if you can't, then you're staying at school. In fact, it's cool. So Jace, Jace went to work and he ended up getting a, a great job um, with a local company down in, in South Adelaide zone who had an association through sponsorship with South Adelaide and, and he went to work, and uh, he was he was working hard. He was doing morning shift, night shift, um, at a place called Flurio Milk, packing milk and into trucks and doing loads. And they they made him work hard for his money, and um, and he he did it. He's got a great work ethic, and um, and his football just blossomed mm-hmm. because he had a different outlet to think about and take his mind off the game for a period of time. Yeah. I'm sure there would have been times during Jason's work day where he's, he was sneaking football, but it wasn't 12 hours a day. It yeah. might have been an hour here and then he was back focused at work. And in my experiences, when players have that outlet, whether it's study, whether it's part-time job, volunteer work, full-time work, or whatever, their performance um, improves. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, and that's that's another great segue, mate. You're, you're, it's almost like you're reading our uh, <laughs> reading our plan. But um, mate, so obviously, um, Jason Horn, he he played um, senior footy in the Sandfield as well, and I, I want to ask you about that because everyone's got a, a unique sort of journey to the draft. Um, and with the, the 18, 19 year olds, uh, it's it's a it's a mix of state footy, club footy, and, and school footy too. How important yeah. do you think it is for aspiring draftees to have exposure to playing against men, maybe in their in their state league competition, um, before they get on an AFL list? Is it crucial, or do you think it's um, case by case? Oh no, it's a case by case scenario, and I'll, I'll give you two real, real life examples right now. So, and both of them are at North Melbourne. Jason Horn, we've already sort of spoken about, he played almost two full years of senior football mm-hmm. for South Adelaide here in the Sample before he gets drafted. And uh, two years ago, Tom Powell, he's at North Melbourne as well. Um, I can't quite remember what draft selection Tom was, but I'm pretty sure it was in the 20s, so it was quite early. And from Sturt, and he didn't, he played under 18 football his whole year, his whole draft year. So two real different, you know, pathways to the AFL. 
I mean, in five years' time, we'll have a pretty good understanding of, you know, how both of those guys are going. I'm, um, I'm very confident that Tom will have a great career. Uh, he might not find the level as quickly as Jason will, but I'm sure he'll be able to find his feet. But it's, it's a different thing. So Tom wasn't ready for league football uh, at Sturt at that particular point because he was still learning the game at under-18 level. Um, so the way I look at it, and every case is different, my, my, my cue for player promotion comes from, is this player still being challenged at the level? If the answer is yes, mm. he stays. If the answer is no, he needs to go up a level. If players aren't being challenged, then growth opportunities decline. Yeah. Um, Caleb Daniel was another great example in my time early down at South Adelaide. He, in, in my first couple of years at South Adelaide coaching under 18s, we, we didn't win many games and we were losing a lot by, you know, 10 plus goals. And Caleb was continually getting 30 to 35 possessions, going at about 70 to 75% efficiency, was winning our clearances, was winning our tackles, and we're still losing by 10 goals every week. There's not much more that Caleb could have done yeah. at that level to enhance his football. Um, so Brad Gotcha was coaching the seniors at, at, um, at South at that stage. The next best thing for Caleb was to go up a level and see how he survives there. Um, he went up and played two games in the reserves and uh, in the end, he played his third game at senior level, at league level, and played the next year and a half mm. at league level and went into the AFL system. So, um, again, I'm not saying that if Caleb had stayed in the under-18s for that whole year, he wouldn't have been drafted and turned out to be the player that he currently is. But at that time, uh, we just felt that he needed more stimulus yeah. and he just needed a new challenge, and, and that had to come at a higher level. And, this is one of the best things about Sandville football and our competition is our players have that luxury of being able to go up a grade, whereas that doesn't necessarily happen uh, in some of the Eastern competitions from what I can hear and what I've seen. Yeah. It can also work the other way. Players can be dropped as well. And, and, and that's, while it, no one wants to see anyone dropped, whether it be from reserves back to 18s or league back to reserves or even league back to 18s, um, it's still interesting. It's interesting to see how different players handle that scenario, and particularly talent players. Because when you think about it, and Rain, he would have seen this in the academy. Most of the players we we work with have never ever not been selected in the team. They've always been mm. the best players, mm -hmm. and and never never have they been dropped from a team. So mm. that's a whole new concept for these players, mm. and and part of their education um, from a holistic viewpoint around how life works is that sometimes they're going to get a kick in the guts and sometimes the sooner they get that the better because they learn how to deal with it they learn that it's not a personal opinion it's based on form or whatever reason and then as coaches we get a chance to see character then because you'll see who um which players start to blame others and which players take responsibility and get to work so yeah it's an interesting concept um but all in all, it, it, in my opinion, it's got to be a case by case scenario on on what's best model. I think. Yeah, some good themes, and a bit. Of, I think it's a there's that model around the different zones of of sort of you know, your comfort zone where they're completely comfortable, and you said they're just not developing. Then the the learning zone, which is where you sort of want to constantly be, and then there's obviously the panic zone. And I think back to sort of um, it sounds like the you know, and, and you read about it and, and see it in 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 Adelaide or or the NES NFL is you've got the 18s. Um, reserves and seniors where what Harry yeah. came through in the system up here in, in Queensland is that you've sort of got it's a huge jump so you go QAFL football obviously there's yeah. some talent football in there too which is disjointed and then and then you jump all the way to a Southport who are playing VFL which is a huge step up mm -hmm. so there's yeah. you know obviously a lot of the kids would have um, you know sort of learnt in and out which is what happens at AFL level you come I know my first year at Richmond I just had to earn my stripes at Coburg, um, started in the Coburg 2s and then built white Coburg 1s and then before I knew it, was, I was playing AFL yeah. football. So just that, I, I suppose, that progression and, and how it sort of works in the in the footy world, which is which is really good. Um, Kevin, in the talent space, mate, the, in the mm. sort of the topic of, of talent, um, 
again for a coach out there it's um you know it may have been more experience of coaching men their whole life and it's all about and 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 even junior club football so a lot is, is coaching they don't probably mean to but coaching to win um when you're in that yeah. sort of space that we've worked in a fair bit a lot a, a lot in it's yeah. it's not it's not just about you know so you you want to teach players to win but it's more probably about development where you you throw them in different spots of where they could be drafted or where they could be seen you know you might have examples of players playing in you know, two or three different spots throughout the whole year. Where, where at club football, they might be just stuck in the in that same comfortable position, back to those yeah. sort of those different zones of learning. Um, yeah. what's some of your views on this, mate? And and sort of being that sort of um, you know, that niche talent sort of coach, where it's not necessarily about you know winning all the time. Yeah, that that's an that's a year by year debate. This one, um, mm. what comes first, development or winning? And and you have to really like when I was employed as a league coach at Port Adelaide. I was employed to win games of football. Mm. Um, when I went to South Adelaide as, and they employed me as a coach, uh, the main goal there was to try and find the best talent and keep them engaged Develop. in the club. Mm. Um, so at our level, our, our job is to try and get a you know, 5 to 10% growth or improvement in t- players that are already really talented um, and, and hopefully prepare them for life in an AFL system, if they're lucky enough to get there. Now, you don't. We don't have to. There's there's no point coaching to win at our level because the players will do that naturally. <laughs> they're competitors. We, we survey our players um, every single year. What do you want most out of this program? List them down. I want this first. Then I want that. Then I want this, and so forth. And across my time in the program, which is five years now, the results are always very, very similar. And the first thing that that they want to do is win, right? The players want to win. The second thing they want to do is they want to get better. And the third thing they want to do is they want to make new friendships. And and if if I went down Mm. to four and five, it would be have fun and play state for South Australia. They're the common themes across five years of us surveying the players. So the players are trying to win already. Um, so they don't need us as coaches working that way. My philosophy is let them try and win. Our job is to try and give them the tools that's going to make winning easier. And um, my view on it, and I'm, I'm doing a presentation to a, at a level two coaches course to, uh, on the weekend, and the theme is um, um, if you if you want to improve a team performance, forget about tactics. Focus on skill level <laughs> because mm. skill level will mm. get will, will will increase player performance far more than tactics will. So that that's generally the philosophy that we and and the, and the coaches in the state pathway program um, take here at sample level. It, it, it changes from year to year in terms of the degree of success. But, um, yeah, from, from my perspective, we're here to, to coach skill acquisition and and um, prepare players to handle the ups and downs of, of elite sport. And if they do that well, then, then the winning will take care of itself. Be all over that one, Harry. Yeah. The process, mate, isn't it? To, you know, that sort of process into, you know, People worrying about just the result at the end of it and win, 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 but you have actually do the process right. It's back to when you teach game plan and and style of play and all that sort of stuff. It's like well, you can have the best style of play in the, in the comp or the best game plan, but you um you know you're obviously going to need to implement it with the, with this skill level. Now, mate, do you have any aspirations? Or it's probably back to you quite early that one of your mentors sort of said being comfortable at your own yeah. sort of um you know, where you're at or, 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 and I know I got hit up a few times being in the, the Suns Academy role for, for six years as head coach. And I didn't really have aspirations to, to go and coach at AFL level or, you know, sort of, you know, keep climbing the ladder. Um, but I wasn't comfortable at the same time too, because I think that talent space changes all the time. There's always different things, you know, yeah. that gets thrown at you. Yeah. Where, where are you like, at currently? Like COVID. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I suppose you just want to get back to coaching and, and have... <laughs> yeah. I'm normally here. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So is that, where are you currently at with that, mate? Do you sort of, you know, you sort of, as you said, you've got a great job and I could certainly yeah. attest to that. It, it is a great job, but, um, you know, sort of, do you have aspirations to sort of get involved at um, AFL level? Oh, look, I'd never say, I'd never turn down a conversation and, um, you know, I was very fortunate late last year. I had an AFL club reach out and have a chat and speak to me ar- around uh, entering their 
system coaching uh, a development team in the AFL. And at the time, it was an interstate club, and I've got two two young kids that are mm. in primary school, so you know they're my number one priority. And um, until they get a bit older, when they become a bit more independent, yeah. you know that might be an option. Yeah. Um, and I love I love the AFL system. I love you know that high performance environment. I actually, you know, that's what stimulates me to get better. And um, so yeah, I wouldn't say no, but at the moment, I'm just totally focused on getting the SA pathway, yeah. um, maximising the draft outcomes and also sample league games for our players. And um, we've made some changes again to our program this year. It changes every year. Mm. And we're now extending to a full season of under-16 football. Initially, uh, or in the years prior, we they play seven games and then two weeks of finals. But we're going to extend that right to a whole year now. So we've had to change what we, you know, our platform program to lead into our state. So... It's a it's a revolving wheel. We we analyse and review every year about what we do and are we getting the outcomes that we design or we set up to get. Um, and initially, something will change. There's no doubt about that. And as we've seen over the last you know two and a half years mm. with COVID, it's, it's a changing beast. You have to be adaptable on the on the run. Um, and we've spent probably more time um, managing players' mindsets in the yeah. last two years than we have actually you know, fine-tuning their skills mm-hmm. because of the environment that they've all grown up in. So comfortable doing this. I love this job. I love working for the Sandfall. I'm really passionate about the competition, as I've, you can probably mm. probably tell. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's some great talent here that I, you know, I, I want to see perform at a high level. So I'll be here for a few years yet, provided they, they want to have yeah, me. Okay, fine. I'm sure yeah, they I'm do. I'm sure they will, mate. sure they will. Um, now, mate, with that, with that talent pathway, so um, I think I know your answer to this, but every, every player's is going to come through with with a different base skill set um, or levels of talent that they're you know born with let's say but then there's other things that come into the equation like work ethic professionalism or maybe adaptability if you're going through a global pandemic um could you expand a little bit more on, on that side of the equation are there any non-negotiables if you want to be an a- afl player like uh, away from natural talent and, and skill yeah great question and really valid point um again i guess if you ask 10 coaches that same question you might get slightly different answers mm. um, based on the, the coaches you know philosophy or belief sets or maybe their own personal experience but I'm, I'm yet to find an elite player who isn't competitive a bit so if, yep. if, yeah. if 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 you don't like competing you can you can f- almost forget about it mm. um that doesn't matter how fast you can run or how far you can kick the ball or how good you look the game, the game, our game, and the way it's played at all levels requires competitors. Um, I coached my daughters under 11s last year, and even that game requires competitors yeah. because, believe me, there is a lot of contested ball to be won. Sure. Yeah, we'll be. <laughs> so, um, the non-negotiable for me is competitiveness. And if, if if I see players who are highly talented but just don't work hard enough to compete when the when the game's on the line, um, you know, it's it's. I just think that, oh, no, that's such a shame because I don't know whether we can teach that. Yeah. I think that's something that's that's learnt from a young age inside their family environment, which they, they grow up in. Um, the classic one is the young kid with the older brothers. He, he's the one. He's the one that's, he, you know, he's going to be competitive because he had to fight to, oh, keep, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fight to get a, a, a feed or a sausage at the party because <laughs> his older brothers are always beating the shit out of him. <laughs> Um, I mean, Joel Selwood, look yeah, at that. Yeah, okay, that's turned out. Yeah. So I get quite excited when I see a talented player and I hear that he's got two older brothers. I go, mm, yes, yeah. this, this is good. Yeah. So that would be one, Harry. If they're not prepared to compete, I, I can't see any... Well, I think their chances of success at the highest level uh, um, reduce significantly. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Well, great answer. Yeah, it's... A- <clears throat> It's and my one to be probably yeah that it's probably intertwined that competitiveness and just that grit resilience where your ups and downs as as we, as we sort of spoke about before. Um, mate, we spoke about um, Horny before and and uh, and obviously time with him and uh, the year that I I watched your team pretty closely the Nationals was um was when Rankin and Lacoste was running around obviously then had a bit to do with those mm-hmm. boys um up on the Gold Coast um. Yeah. Obviously, it was a superb team um, back then and, and a fair bit of talent coming through. Just touching on those, sort of maybe those two particular players, um, where do you think yeah. you know their future's at? Um, and might put a bit of a curveball on that one for our, our listeners. Where do you think they'll return to SA? I reckon they'll 
they'll uh, they'll be up 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 on the Gold Coast. Well, it all depends probably on the success, doesn't it? But um, well, it's it's an interesting actually, couple of years for those boys. It it, it will be. Um, I, I there was a an article in the paper here was it today or yesterday on Jack, and uh, he was quoted in saying that um, you know he's not going to make his mind up any any time soon and. And yeah. the biggest influence on him making his mind up will be how the how the Suns mm-hmm. perform this year, which you know, I think that's a fair comment yeah. to be honest. I think that every player has a right to <laughs> want success, um, but I mean Isaac and and Jack, really different backgrounds and different um, environments they've come from to get to the AFL, mm-hmm. but both quality quality people, um, and I'm sure they'll make. A decision that's, um, or put it the way, I know Jack will make a really informed decision what he decides to do. And for Isaac, I just want to see Isaac playing. Yeah. He's too good not to be playing that's AFL. Exciting. And uh, I, I spoke to um, one of the coaches at the Gold Coast last year, Ains, in. I was trying to drop hints mm. about just playing him in the midfield until he Get blows him up. up. Get him up the ground, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Play him in the midfield until he blows up, and then put him forward. Mm. Or, or, or yeah. the, um, he wasn't playing. In my opinion, and far be it for yeah. me to, to, I haven't seen him for a while. But the Isaac I knew needed to be where the game had to be won. Yeah. And that, and for me, that's midfield. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that he hopefully gets up ground a bit. Yeah. Even yeah, on a wing, or you know, throwing across half yeah. back at times, just to, as you yeah. said, at the AFL level, it's a challenging, challenging game oh, to yeah. sort of find your feet and. I think yeah, he needs, exactly. as you said, be around the action. So yeah, be... and it looks like Jack's going to play a bit more forward this year as well, from yeah. what I'm hearing. So that'll be uh, in, in, in that carnival that you mentioned. Yeah, he, James, was... he he played forward, then he ended up going back. Yeah, to take care of Ben King yeah. in that last game um, at at Marvel Stadium. But both those boys came into our national championship team out of league league level football. Mm. And um, both of the, it took both of them uh, a game to find their feet. It's not as easy coming back from league no. level football back to under eighteen. It's different, isn't it? <laughs> being able to perform. A lot of people think, "Oh, well, this guy's been playing league football, so he'll come back and dominate." And I can tell you that doesn't happen. No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't happen. Will it didn't happen for Will Gould as well. Yeah. Um, it's been number of players. I mean, even Jace. Yeah. Jason's the only game Jace played last year was our first game against Western Australia. And, mm. And, and Jason will be the first to tell you that it was probably the worst game of football he played all year. Yeah. Um, so it's not as easy coming back to national level when they're playing playing league football. So it took them a while to get, to get going. But, um, yeah, both of them um, got their football going in, in those last sort of two or three games in Melbourne. And, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, mate, something we talk about a lot here on the show is the balance between um, doing the program that's given to you by the team, whether it's a rep team or, or a club team, and then doing extras away from the team sessions. Um, it, it's a real balancing act because if you don't do extras, you probably won't get ahead of your peers. But if you do too much, you risk an overuse injury. I know some coaches that just yeah. try and control absolutely everything and um, and keep it in-house. Um, but then there's other coaches and it's actually something that I think Rainsy um, did really well back in the academy. He was willing to give certain players trust to do their own thing. Um, how do you manage that and support your players with the when they want to do extras? Uh, so the, the interesting thing here is a generation that we're coaching as well. Um, generation Z. Gen Z. They're, they're weirdos. Got a podcast on that they as well. Are, we've, got a, we've got an episode <laughs> on that. I'll talk about Have that. Have you? Yeah, yeah. So oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tune into that one because yeah. I love... I, I get That's really inter- fascinated. very interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did an online thing late last year um, with this professor from America around the generation. It was fascinating. Yeah. But uh, um, I think... I'm a bit like Rainsy. A coach who tries to control everything a player does across the whole squad is going to go crazy, <laughs> and and yeah. in the end, he's probably just going to it's probably going to nullify the players' creativity as well. And so, my philosophy would be to um, educate the player on the risks of overload and what overload could look like, and you know the effects of overload long term, um, and then educate them on how to make good decisions on you know, what's enough and what's not too much. Mm. And probably the more important thing is, and we always say this to our players, just because you're training more doesn't mean you're going to get better. Mm. It's what are you doing? Is your extras going to be working on a facet of your game that you need to get better at? 
Because if you're already a late runner, doing another conditioning session on Saturday morning is a total waste of your time. So no point being able to run but fumbling the football. Instead of doing your extra athletic session on Saturday morning, maybe spend that 45 yeah. minutes on some touch work. So we, t- we tell them to train smart. Hmm. Don't train more, train yeah. smart. Um, and then you just hope that they make the right decisions. We can't. There's so much crossover with the players in our program. Uh, well, I've just finished a program with 38 players, and I reckon six of those 38 are doing a senior league training program right now across the eight clubs. I would think that about 10 of them, uh, no, probably about 10 of them are training with their colleges as well as their clubs. Uh, and then the rest are doing an under 18 program. And some of those under 18 clubs are training four times a week. Mm. Some are training twice a week. So you can't have a blanket rule because everyone's got a different program. Some guys um, do extra running training on certain days. Some guys will do an extra gym session. Some guys will do yoga. So yeah, to have full say and full control over all programs is unrealistic in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Um, just every time I speak to a player, I, I ask him, what have you done the last few days? Tell me what your trainings look like. And you, you generally get a full, fairly good idea of whether they're at risk of o- overtraining through that conversation yeah. um, with, the, with the player themselves. And, and there's nothing better than a five-minute conversation on the phone to find out how your player's going. Totally agree. And they're just in that communication aspect of it. And as you said, not, you know, sort of once you... One size fits all. That's the you know the sort of yeah. the wrong approach. But before we it doesn't um, work. It yeah. doesn't work with this generation. No, it they, doesn't. They they want to be treated as individuals. Correct. And they want to have they want to have a say in what their life looks like. Mm. And, and fair enough, we yeah. have we have to adapt and and cater to that. Yeah, exactly. And mate, before we wrap up, just uh, obviously been on the the booking system for on our one on one system for. About, probably about two years, I think it was through COVID. Um, yeah, um, it was. And being, mate, but being a, a, a really popular coach, and there's no doubt, obviously, after listening for, to you for about an hour, it's, uh, as, 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 uh, there's no surprises there. Um, mate, what can players expect when they sort of book a private session with you? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for thanks for reaching out and seeing if I was interested in doing it. I'll, I, I'm actually absolutely loving it. Mm. Um, COVID was great because it gave me a reason to get out of the house and stay alive. <laughs> Um, but I found it really helpful. I found it uh, as a coach, when you're coaching talented players for a period of time, you start to um, not lose your coaching or, or coach acquisition skills, but you're sort of over, they, they, rel- they, they get pushed to the side. But I found doing my sessions with, with the players, and I'm talking as young as nine, as old as 20, at various different levels, mm. I've now had to remember how to teach skill. Mm. And... And I found that quite enjoyable. I think I'm a better coach through that experience. So it's one session. I'm, one session I'm teaching a 12 year old girl how to hold the football to kick it well, and I'm, the next session I'm teaching a 16 year old um, how to position himself at a stoppage because he already knows how to take the ball cleanly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm loving the variety. Uh, the players are all really, really interesting. Everyone's got their own little story. Yeah. Um, so with me, I, there's there's two things that Every single training session that I do, regardless of the age of the player, the sex of the player, or their ability level, we will always work on hand-eye coordination and clean hands. Mm-hmm. That's non-negotiable. That's every single session. Oh, really. My philosophy is if you fumble the football, um, that put pressure. That puts pressure on you and your team. So I'm big. Right. Again, I'm really big on selling clean hands. I think we saw the premiers of last year in the in the uh, in the clinches of the battle. Just didn't fumble. Um, Melbourne were, you know, terrific, and you know, said you got to be able to secure the footy and get it. And I think that's what finals footy is all about. And um, certainly, that key aspect of a player is going to be working on that consistently, which is which is really good, mate. Um, thanks for your time today. It's just been an absolute pleasure having you on board. Great coach, no obviously one of our most popular coaches on the system platform. Um, and it's yeah, just been a really insightful chat to uh, obviously that talent space and and coach uh, coach sort of pathway player pathway all the above and it's um yeah it's been great to have you on mate no thanks very much for the chats it's been good to catch up and connect thanks for having me thanks bangers now if today's episode wasn't enough for you and you want some more information some more insights from tony you're in luck 
Last week, we launched our Footy IQ membership, which is basically a subscription service that gives you access to um, hours of content, whether it's Drills Library, Insights Library. Um, we have some fantastic information there, all centered around Aussie Rules Football. And one awesome feature of that membership is the bonus podcast. So at the end of every recording, we've just finished recording with Tony. Tony actually hung around for another 20 minutes or so, and we recorded the bonus episode. The bonus episode is similar to what we do on the main podcast, but we really try and narrow in on those key takeaways and give the listeners, give the members, the Footy IQ members, some clear, concise takeaways and something that they can implement into their training, coaching, or life immediately. So if you're interested in the bonus content, um, jump over to our website, oneononefootball.com.au. Um, up the top, you'll see the Footy IQ logo. Click on that, and if you become a member, uh, you'll have access to the bonus podcast, not only from this week, last week with uh, Jason Akamanis, and also every future podcast that we do. Once again, thanks for listening, guys. We really appreciate having your eyes and ears, and we look forward to seeing you again for the next episode. Remember to hit that follow or subscribe button to stay updated every time a new episode gets released. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening to the One on One Football Podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes, and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at oneononefootball.com.au. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for the next episode.